leg bones in there, tucked in the flesh like bits of shrapnel no one bothered to remove. A fact you know, but never use in conversation. What if those Tyrannosaurus arms never showed, but stayed, creased upon themselves, remembering the time when the rest of the body wasn't so pure and efficient that it could strike like a bullwhip, crush and pound with trip hammer legs, and lay open a triceratops with its jackknife jaws alone? What if, inside that chest, the tyrant king folded his secret hands in vestigial prayer. What would we have to laugh at then? How else could we make the terrifying monarch of life into a caricature of us, who have lived so briefly where he reigned so long? Gone. Oh, please. <clears throat> Gone. When the groom's mother died on the way to the wedding in San Diego, it became a wedding from an American novel. Everyone took the lead, and no one agreed how it should end. And so we focused on the purpose of each day. What else could we do? Sometimes that purpose was the wedding on the beach, and sometimes it was the mother's body still in Utah where she died. Everything fell into place as if it had been written, which does not mean everything went well. It means it seemed like an imagination was at work, the way the absurd makes you think that life is fiction. It was an American novel right down to the road trip, because American literature is about grief spread over space. Instead of the honeymoon, the bride and groom drove his mother's ashes back from the desert, taking the long way, and photographs with the ashes in front of the Grand Canyon and the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino, which she had planned to see on the ride home. We all carry the story, and we tell it to anyone who asks, How was your summer? Expecting the usual, good. But it was not good, and you can only tell so many lies. So everyone who was there found their own way to talk about it. Sometimes with the surprise up front, sometimes in the middle, or setting the whole thing up for laughs with a dark twist at the end, because characters in a novel can escape anything except their story. I've surrounded myself with information, facts, and every day the same pop song about absence lingering in the fragmented heart plays itself over and over in my brain. And I barely knew her. People are making lists. Update your will. What will you leave your children? My wife's sister, tired of her quarrels, packed up her family and moved right across the compass. But the way I see it, a song stuck in your head is your mind reaching for poetry, like a drowning mouth reaching for air. And you never know how beautiful air or light or life are until you must gasp. A love poem. Home for a crescent moon. And this is for Lisa, who's right there. You can feel them moving. Words like elephants over the dusty earth. Words for the glass of water on my desk. Words for death and mourning and philosophy. And the question of my fingertips spread over your thigh while you're driving. I want them back, the words that follow each other like elephants along a path that only they can see, and they trust it with every ounce of a million pounds of life. We are moving in a machine that sets whole countries a mere day apart, but still, my hand across your thigh, and it means everything. That one gesture, 
that ease, my fingers spread out like I'm playing an octave with one hand. You are in control of the car. The miles roll under us. The road is Aristotle's dream of road. Every mile, the same as the last. I am writing you who feels me touching your leg, and only you can see me in the corner of your eye, a crescent moon where I have every face I have ever had at once. So my father was uh, in a home uh, for the last eight years of his life. Um, so we're going to go visit him there. Um, this poem is called Just So Story. It's a rem the title, a remnant of the original um, theory behind the book. So this is a Just So Story. We drove the whole family through the mountains in a compact car, just so my father could pet a dog. He reached out from the wheelchair he was belted into and pet the dog we brought into the blessing and curse of the last home he knew. They sedated him well, and his voice was the voice of a tiny being wandering the catacombs of his body. In its smallness, it sounded the way I imagine the voice of hope aching within the chest after Pandora slammed down the lid. He didn't give up, my dad. And he joked that the drool on his lips made him most like the dog among us all. And this is the story of his escape. He had lost his short-term memory, but he was still his wily self. From across the corridor, he watched the visitors and the staff key in the code to open the door until he got it. But by the time no one was around and he had wheeled himself over to the keypad, he'd forgot. He could still walk a bit back then, so finally he just bulled his way out. He got out of his chair and he pushed past someone's guest while the door was open and he was free. It took them 20 minutes to guess he'd made it outside. And he was caught in the street by a nurse who chased him down the sidewalk, pushing a wheelchair and calling as she pushed, Ralph, come back, come back. Today, with his family around him, Ralph's fingers curl through the pleasing fur of my dog's neck, like a magician passing a coin across his knuckles. One of the staff at the home stops with a camera. The snapshots will be waiting when we get back to our place. This is him with the dog in his lap. We drove three days over the mountains for this. The day after 9-11, all aircraft were grounded. You may remember that. And it was a strange day for all sorts of reasons, all sorts of traumatic and terrible reasons. But it was also the last day that I will probably ever experience where the sky was the way it was before we'd invented the airplane. It's a sky that you may never hear because it's so quiet. And my father and I were talking about the whole experience of the sky changing after that. And he told me the story when he was a child in Yorkshire, leading up to the Second World War, the German government sent their Zeppelin, the Hindenburg, to fly over Britain. Just sent it to fly over, not to do anything, just to show them what they had. And Dad was on the ground when this Zeppelin came overhead. Propaganda. What a silence contained the sky the morning after 9-11. As if the atmosphere, oxygen numb, had fled the century in cloudy recollection of itself a hundred years away from us and here. And then the planes returned 
to shear the air with engines. I have learned what my father learned when the Germans sent the Hindenburg on its badwill tour of Britain before the war, and a lad playing cricket behind a Yorkshire church gazed up when the Hindenburg gunned its motors, cut them, and floated overhead, a shadow, swastika finned, casting a shadow big as neighborhoods down from the English blue. They were showing off then, everyone knew, showing off what they could do at a sieging height in the heavens, from where no human hand had dared before to kill. My father did end up being a soldier, fought in the British Army in the uh, Second World War, and, uh, and stayed on for the wars we refer to as the post-colonial wars thereafter. One of the things that happened for my father when he was a child, when he was a boy, was he was schooled in the English system. The English system insisted that you memorize poetry. That was a big deal. And uh, he loved it. He just adored the sound of the poem, the recitation of the poem. And in many ways, I think that dad kept his sanity through everything by holding on to those particular poems. And when I was a child, he would recite the poems to me and I would learn the poems back. And, and he would start a poem and I would carry on. And then I'd stop and he would carry on. And in many ways, um, that was both the founding of myself as a, as a poet but also it was the most significant conversation I had, the lifetime conversation I had with him was through poetry. And even though dad lost a lot of his memory because of the dementia, he hung on to the poems all the way to the end. And I'm gonna take you with me now to the last conversation I had with him um, uh, before he died in 2011. Uh, there's a lot of quotations. Uh, I'll let you right into that child. There's a lot of quotation in this poem. Uh, one of my father's favorite poems was the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas, um, who uh, you may have studied him before. Uh, very significant poet, very significant reciter of poetry. And uh, his name became synonymous with poetry so much that when Bob Zimmerman wanted to choose a name that would acknowledge his own connection to the poetic tradition, uh, he chose Bob Dylan. And uh, under that name, of course, won the Nobel Prize. Um, a couple of poems that you may have heard of. One is called Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, about Dylan talking to his father. Some of you are nodding, yeah. Uh, talking to his father who is dying. So when, when Dylan's writing this poem, he's in the same spot I'm at. And the other is called Fern Hill, which is um, a lament for a life. And those two poems I'm quoting in here, you'll hear them. With the dying of the light, I recited to him, now as I was young and easy, and in the cough-afflicted wheeze that was left of my father's voice, he answered, under the apple boughs. And so it went between us in the days I waited for him to recover the way hope pillows its sails with nothing or falter, fade, and pass away. You haven't heard time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea until you've heard it from the wizened mouth of a man in the not knowing when before his death. This is the reply to the poet who longs for the old man to rage at the night and heed his child's plea, don't go. My father's was the soft song of sickened lungs, lips that lost the taste for even one more swallow while I waited with him in the light that faded as it drew close. I saw him from the doorway, silent as a mummy, his hands locked into each other like power shovels tipped into the posture of the day's last work, the crew gone home for the night. Once he waved after days of Shakespeare and Dickens, the anthem of literature he had been taught to love as his country itself, 
and through which he spoke best the savage and gentle contradictions of his heart. I'd said, I love you, and he'd said, I love you too, without the artifice of poetry. And he waved when I moved from the bed, the way a boat, pushed by a hand gone still on the dock, carries yet its force across the water. It is here, now, what that hand held when it held itself up. The lull before the poem begins. The surrender when it's done. Prayer. My father taught me the poem was a bed of gravel the rain could not wash away. A sheet of particle board cut clean with a knife, not a saw. The sideways glance you use to find a contact lens on the carpet. Poetry was touching the hiker in front of you in the small of the back, so you both made it up the hill. My father went to war with his head full of English verse. But although he spoke with them, the language of King George's soldiers he fought with side by side, he taught me only these words of theirs, Sat Siri Akal, God is truth. Thank you. Just uh, three more. The wonder of life. Once, I watched a praying mantis eat a snake. This was decades ago, and soon I would be leaving the woman I'd promised to live with forever. The mantis ate the snake like a shredder eating a sausage, and all I saw was the end of things. But I am in our house today, and mantis and snake are loose from the meaning that once held them. Genus Mantis waited 100 million years for its first reptile lunch and liked it. Over time, flesh folded this way and that, everything born with a taste for the future. Even then, you were on your way, and after that, our children. The answer is, be patient. I saw a praying mantis eat a snake. There is hope for us all. <laughs> okay, um, I like this turn. It's become lots of love poems. Um, when uh, Lisa, my wife, who became my wife, she was my girlfriend, back at that stage, it's all uncertain, she uh, took me to meet her father, Phil, and uh, it was a big test, right? So Phil got to the point where he asked the, the cutoff question, whether I was going to make anything out of myself in, in his family or not. Uh, we were sitting over lunch, and he said, do you golf? <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> but I said, I'll, I'll try. I can learn. Um, Phil uh, uh, lived in uh, Regina, which is the capital city of Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the big golf course there is the Royal Regina. In, in Canada, of course, if anything's royal, it's like some member of the royal family came and said, I like this spot. So this was the Royal Regina golf course. Mulligan. Oh, sorry. Um, Phil died in 2012, so I read this poem for, uh, at his memorial. Mulligan, in memoriam for my father-in-law, Phil Rouleau. My virgin shot from the first tee at the Royal Regina took off straight for the spectators. I think I just nodded, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Took off straight for the spectators. Hit a tree, 
bounced back with a crack like a nail gun and landed 30 feet behind me. Here's the thing about golf. It's impossible to exaggerate how badly you've done. So it's the sport that's most like life. It takes a certain kind of mind to play the game. To love it is something else again. I wanted to change the world and get things right. Phil wanted to love the world as it was and do his best. 30 feet is not a long way until it's backwards. The ball nested in the grass, the egg of shame. The silence was so full you could have walked on it and Phil must have because I didn't hear him until he stood beside me, a new ball in his hand. Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try. Yoda never played golf. <laughs> Yoda was wrong. For proof, I offer Phil's wisdom that kept me in that game and in how many more I cannot say since then. That happens, he said. Try again. And I'm going to close with uh, the last poem in the book, which is the longest poem in the book, and it's called Haiku. <laughs> I have never been adept at haiku, but I keep returning to this one. It would be easy to dismiss my frustration with a joke. It demands haiku be within chrysanthemum. Damn, I got nothing. But that quits the moment, and the moment is too much a moment to quit. A honeybee dormant in a luxurious flower on a cold March morning, the sun barely touching the petals, my wife and I walking along just then. And there's the insect, vulnerable and asleep where it chose to hide itself when the cold came on and it knew there was no way back to the hive in time. And the flower cradling the bee, the instrument of its own propagation in the shapes and scent it used to bring it there. The bee in the flower looks exotic, like a clownfish in an anemone. But there it is, by the sidewalk, in a neighbor's garden, in the ordinary light. Is that what haiku is? A bee noticed in a flower? Basho said yes, and my favorite haiku is still his. A bee staggers out of the peony. Maybe it's the verb. Maybe I'm looking for a word that does for sleep what staggers does for walk. The bee snoozes, dozes, dreams. But if I am, then am I not just trying to be Basho? And what's the point of that? You learn and try, then you unlearn and do. It isn't about the flower or the bee. It isn't about haiku or the prose poem, a little story that goes nowhere except if you're lucky to Aha! It's about the one thing you notice, and then the why. Yes, a bee thumbed into a flower by the cold of a night still unburned away by the morning sun. A man walking with his wife, but not walking with her in his mind. Instead, looking away and down, taking things in with his eyes. Perhaps he is thinking, Perhaps he has just said something and he's waiting for her to say something back. She is holding his hand, but he has let go of the thought of holding hers, and something has got his attention. Something connected to what's happened before he saw it in a way he could not speak of at the time, and now he's writing 
connecting before and after, through now. Experience is to a poem what a belly button is to a mammal. Bees sleep in flowers all the time. Dormant in a million darkened books, poems wait for someone to lift their caps. The man knows that everything he writes will eventually become patient like them, as if he never wrote what he writes now. At last the man sees. The poem is the woman's hand resting in his own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amazing poetry. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we're now going to begin with the Q&A period. So like I said at the beginning of the presentation, we have Titiana and Daisy. They have mics. Uh, I know some of you are working on papers. Some of you are creative writers. Some of you might just be intrigued with the process of writing. So feel free to ask Driver, maybe even Canadian trivia. I don't know. <laughs> uh, feel free to ask, and I'm sure he'll be happy to respond. Uh, after about 10, 15 minutes, we will then uh, allow you to meet and greet Richard and get an autographed copy of his book. You can also purchase some of his other books if you'd like. Who would like to take the first question? <laughs> <laughs> 